Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the robotics seminar. It's a pleasure to have with us Gregory Cherikjia. So Gregory is the professor and head of the mechanical engineering department at NUS. Before that, he spent a long time at John Hopkins University. And his work, his work has you know, received multiple awards. He is a fellow of IEEE. He is also a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, where recently he was awarded the Machine Design Award. And you know, many of us, you know, when we do robotics, because robotics is a vast discipline, get involved in the nitty gritties of it, and there's so much to do. But Gregory has managed to do much more. You know, for some of you might know, but he is also involved in research in biology and doing some protein kinematics, which is quite cool. And you know, today uh, uh, Gregory is going to talk about robot imagination and you know, how we can build a future with robots in our houses. So Gregory, welcome. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, visiting today. Um, so yes, uh, the topic today is a new one for me, relatively new. It's what I call robot imagination, and it's about affordance-based reasoning of unknown or previously unseen objects. Um, so before I talk about that, I'm going to put on my department head hat and talk about NUS mechanical engineering a little bit, because part of this is a recruiting trip. We have lots of slots open for starting faculty. Uh, and then a little bit of review of old topics that I've worked on before this new topic. And then we'll get into the, uh, you know, this affordance-based reasoning and what I call the spirit dictionary. Okay. So first of all, uh, where is Singapore? <laughs> so, uh, you know, China is up here, Taiwan, Hainan Island. Uh, Singapore is all the way down here, one degree north of the equator, okay, at the tip of Malaysia. Uh, you'd be surprised how few people actually know that. Uh, NUS, uh, National University of Singapore, has about 40,000 students. About a quarter of them are postgraduate. Uh, the majority of those are master's students. And we ha there's very competitive uh, startup packages uh, to attract young people from great places like MIT. Uh, and uh, we live in, uh, the foreigners like myself live in subsidized housing right across the street where there's a couple of swimming pools and a, a five minute walk to campus. Uh, and NUS is uh, consistently ranked as either the top or one of the top universities in Asia. And I'm happy to say in the three years that I've been the ME department chair, our rankings have gone up from 15 to nine in the, in the world in mechanical engineering. Uh, so Singapore looks like this. You have buildings with greening to keep the temperature down. You have a contrast between new and old. Uh, it's a very uh, multicultural society. You have you know, uh, Buddhist temples and mosques and churches and Hindu temples. Um, uh, there's a lot of greenery. You can go, it's a, it's a reasonable sized city, but you can also go on nature walks uh, and see various things. There are beaches, and if that is not enough for you, you can go out and see monkeys and horn, hornbills and other sort of creatures that you don't normally see. So the mechanical engineering department uh, is, uh, is pretty large by my standards since I spent quite a few years at Johns Hopkins, which is a small university. Uh, the, the department has about 1,800 students all together. Most of those are graduate, but we have uh, typically between three and 400 uh, graduate students. And there's all the areas that you would expect in a mechanical engineering department. Uh, you know, so the mechanics, design, vibration, control, uh, air conditioning, big thing in Singapore, so we have people who do thermal management, uh, manufacturing, etc. And then since I've been department head, uh, these are the people who have joined the, the staff, uh, well, including myself. Uh, but then uh, in the upper right corner there, uh, Professor Cecilia Lasky uh, joined as a full professor from Italy. She's famous for octopus uh, robotic arms, soft robots. Uh, Sunmi Shin here and Yujun Tan are in the MIT 35 under 35 for Asia this last year. Um, 
And then, uh, so uh, Gianmarco here and uh, uh, Guillaume joined, uh, both Europeans. And then uh, we have a bunch of people doing uh, metal 3D printing, soft materials, soft robotics, origami design, uh, and, and other things, ba you know, battery, efficient battery design, et cetera. So it's a very comprehensive university. I should say, actually, Jason Koo here came from MIT. He was uh, in Eric Demain's lab. Uh, and taught in the CS department. Uh, so uh, my, now I'm good jumping to my old work. So going way back to my PhD thesis oh, 30 years ago, uh, it, I worked on something that we called hyper-redundant robots. And so the title of this uh, slide is Hyper-Redundancy Resolution, a concept whose time has come again because uh, the, the topics in uh, the modeling of these sorts of snake-like robots uh, are equally applicable to uh, a very popular area these days, continuum robotics, as well as soft robotics, where you have a backbone curve that captures the macroscopic geometry, and then the degrees of freedom in that, macros in that curve are constrained to, so that you have relatively few degrees of freedom. So that's known uh, these days as model reduction, we called it the modal approach to hyper-redundancy resolution at that time. So uh, I bring that up because uh, I see papers rediscovering this idea in the recent literature. Uh, so uh, the, the basic idea there was you have a continuum filament. It might be that you want to minimize the, uh, the curvature of that while satisfying some constraints or, or having it uh, constrained to a particular uh, linear combination of modes in curvature. Uh, and the idea was that regardless of the overall macroscopic structure of the robot arm, we use the backbone curve to guide the physical structure. So whether it's uh, a serial structure with uh, revolute joints or a rubber tube or a cascade of uh, parallel platforms uh, or bellows or whatnot, we could capture sort of snake-like, elephant trunk-like, uh, tentacle-like uh, manipulators using all of the same kind of uh, methodology. Something else that uh, I spent a significant amount of time on is modular self-reconfigurable robots. And that led to uh, what we call self-replicating robots, robots that can build copies of themselves from basic parts. And so here's one sort of universal constructor design developed by my uh, former student, Matt Moses. And here's a video of that uh, in action. So this is a robot made of many, many blocks. Each block is relatively simple, and the robot can pick and place the blocks and basically uh, screw them into place. And so there's hundreds of blocks here. And so the idea is, uh, so what is the idea of self-replicating self robot? You have fairly basic parts, and you know, the robot puts them together to make a copy. So uh, there are we came up with this idea of the degree of self-replication. So you can have a self-replicating robot where there's relatively few blocks and the robot puts it together. That is easier than if you have hundreds of blocks. And hundreds of blocks are easier than if you're a bacterium eating basic nutrients and making a copy of yourself, right? So, uh, so there's a, a continuum, a degree of self-replication. And we wanted to push toward a higher degree of self-replication and also toward a higher degree of environmental entropy to ha handle the disorder. Because if you have a, a set of ordered blocks, it's much easier to pick and place them than if they're at random in the environment. Uh, so, uh, so why care about self-replicating robots? Well, you know, back when I was a teenager, I remember reading in a magazine about you know, NASA thinking about self-replicating lunar factories. And uh, so in fact, we, uh, we started developing that some time ago. So the idea is, can you actually, is it feasible to have something where you take solar energy in and sand and from the, on the surface of the moon, let's say, and make a system that self-replicates? So people say, well, that's far out. But I say it's not as far out as sending astronauts with shovels to make habitats, right? So. Um, Anyway, so we're, this, uh, this concept kind of comes back every 20 years or so. So uh, we wrote a review about that relatively recently. Uh, another area that uh, we've worked in is uh, 
team uh, diagnosis and repair. So you have a bunch of robots that are working together in a team. And each robot is modular. Here, this is made of four modules. And so they're, about, they're going about doing their business, whether it's construction or reconnaissance. And then let's say one of them breaks down. So what, how do the others determine what's wrong with it? Or even more than that, periodically, each member of the team can be diagnosed by the other members by doing a little dance and having the others watch and then determine whether the performance is within normal bounds or characteristic of a fault state. And so uh, these sorts of ideas uh, involve a lot of mathematics uh, because you're talking about probabilities of trajectories that represent normal performance versus different fault states. And so a lot of our effort in my group over the years has been in the development of the underlying mathematics. So for example, errors propagate under convolution. And this top equation is a convolution integral on a Lie group, such as the group of rigid body motions. And there's a corresponding uh, convolution theorem, just like there is in classical Fourier analysis. Uh, also, if you have a distribution of, of, you know, on SE2, SE3, or any unimodular Lie group, you can define a concept of mean. M here, the, the mean is defined as satisfying an equation like this. And then you can define a covariance. And when you define things like this, then they have nice properties under propagation, under convolution. So the means multiply, the covariances add with a particular change of reference frame by this uh, adjoint matrix. So these are very analogous to what happens in Euclidean space, where the, the mean under convolution just adds, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the covariances add under convolution. That's a non-parametric result. And so then what do you do with that? Well, you can put these quantities in to define a Gaussian distribution on a Lie group. So for example, if you have a kinematic cart, and you tell it to go straight forward with speed omega for each wheel, but then there's noise because the wheels are slipping or there's jitter in the motors, then what you're going to get instead, is, instead of going straight, you're going to get many stochastic sample paths. And if you plot out where the center of the robot is after a particular value of time, you'll get this so-called banana distribution. So that, that results from integrating this stochastic differential equation where x, y, theta are just the rigid body parameters and uh, the omegas are the speeds of the wheels, r is the wheelbase, and the dw's are, are just Gaussian white noise, increments of a Wiener process. So uh, we wrote this paper because if you look at, at this distribution, it looks like a banana. It's known in SLAM as the banana distribution. Uh, but what we showed was uh, that banana distribution is actually a Gaussian distribution, but not in the original x, y, theta coordinates, but rather in the so-called exponential coordinates of the Lie group SE2, okay? And uh, so, uh, so that's a concrete example of how this stuff is used. And we also used it in modeling DNA statistical mechanics because it's the same problem. It's just there, the DNA, uh, you're param parameterizing the path by arc length rather than by time. And so, uh, so uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time on DNA and proteins, et cetera. And so, you know, once you work in enough topics, it, there's not just one venue to publish the work. So then I ended up writing a bunch of books to make it available in the broader community. Actually, I brought a couple. This one's for Russ. I'll, bring, I'll give it to you at the end. I have two copies with so, uh, uh, okay, anyway, so, uh, okay, so let's move on then. That's all old stuff. Uh, the new stuff is about object affordances and what I call the spirit dictionary. So I'll explain that. Oh, I should go back, I should say, you know, all of the titles of my old works are like, you know, you know, convolution, non commutative harmonic analysis for Lie groups, or information theoretic this, or entropy you know, production, uh, so uh, very technical things, but my new papers largely have simple titles like, is that a chair, okay? Or put the bear on the chair, or prepare the chair for the bear, or can I pour into it? So I'm gonna go over 
all of these because some of them are published, you know, ICRA 2020 or uh, 2021, uh, IROS 2021, or uh, things that are posted on the archive. So what is the idea of robot imagination? Okay. So, um, so the idea is how can we give robots foresight of action before they commit to an action? Okay. So it's imagining uh, the, uh, what they're going to do before they do it. Uh, and so this is not learning. This is, doesn't assume any training, uh, any prior information about you know, many examples of images or whatnot. Uh, and so it's, it's different than that, but it could be uh, complementary to it. Okay, so I'm not a purist. I don't say we only have to do it this way, but at the beginning, at least, we're doing it this way, and then we can merge it with learning uh, later. So, and the idea is, what happens if the robot encounters an object that it's never seen before, and it has no database for it? How can it determine what that object is, what the class of, uh, what class that object belongs to, and how that object can be used? And so, you know, one of the motivations for this is you see robots everywhere. So this is, uh, you know, in the lobby of a hotel in China before the pandemic. Uh, and you have the floor sweeping robot and you have the robot that greets you. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, they're not, they're not very smart because, you know, I waited until this was going to happen because I knew it was going to happen. I didn't stage it. Uh, but, you know, they don't have any, any you know, set grounding or... Uh, or a sense of self or anything like that. Of course, we don't know how to do that anyway, but we, I'm trying to work towards that because what I want to do is develop robots to put in the home for elder care, especially in a place like Singapore or East Asia in general, where uh, the, you know, the population uh, is aging. And so, uh, so how, how are we going to develop robots to take care of grandma in the home? Okay, well, the base for what we're building on is related to this idea of affordances, which goes back to the psychologist J.J. Gibson. Uh, actually, I had never heard about Gibson or affordances until Stefano Sawato gave a talk at Hopkins uh, several years ago, and so then that was per percolating in my mind for a while. And then, uh, you know, Ruzna uh was working on active perception and what she called functionality of objects going way back. So what happens is people use different words, and then you know somebody's doing it over here, somebody's doing it over here, and then they don't know about each other. But anyway, there's there's a prior work that we're building on, and uh, so what we're trying to develop is what we call this spirit dictionary. And so the idea is, well, you know, in robotics, each of us is doing our own thing. Somebody's doing slam, somebody's doing vision, somebody's doing control, somebody's doing motion planning or kinematics or whatever. Each is a puzzle piece, but in my view, uh, what was missing or what is still missing from the robotics community as well as from individual robots themselves is what I call spirit, which is a spatially information-rich interaction-based task dictionary. Okay, so it's a forced acronym uh, to tie together uh, a number of areas. So I'll explain what this is about. So what we're doing is we're building an affordance-based dictionary of common household objects, okay? And we're starting with chair and cup, for example. So, uh, so what do I mean by an affordance-based definition? Well, a chair is basically something you sit on, and a cup is basically something that you can pour liquid into and drink from, okay? So those are just zeroth order baseline definitions that can be subject to change. And so the idea is that if we have uh, if we have these definitions that are testable in simulation, then when a robot encounters an item, it can go through its list of definitions and ask, is this object one in my list? It might not be, it might miss, there could be an overlap, right? Uh, or it could not be in the list at all. But the idea is to construct a, a list which is fairly complete of things that will be encountered in the home. And so then when, one, when the robot sees a, a new object, it could be in a structured or unstructured environment, uh, then uh, it can handle it. So I'm going to demonstrate this concretely with this paper. Again, the title is, Is That a Chair? Uh, from ICRA 2020. And this was led by my uh, PhD student, uh, Hong Tao Wu, and a visiting student uh, 
Devin Misra, who was an undergraduate at the time when we did this work. Um, so chairs come in many different shapes and forms. Of course, you can train a network to recognize them, but that, that's not our goal, because if you just look at the shape, it could be a dollhouse chair, or it could be the teacup ride at the amusement park, or it could be a picture of a chair on the wall. And so appearance by itself is not everything. So, uh, so what if the robot encounters an object and it wants to assess, is that a chair? So the idea of imagination is it will scan the object, put it in a physics-based simulation, and then ask, is there a way to orient the object so that a humanoid figure can sit on it? Okay? And so, uh, in other words, is the chair sittable? Or is the object sittable? Because that's the affordance of a chair. Okay? So what we do is exactly what I said. The robot goes, it scans the previously unseen object, it constructs a model, puts it in the simulation environment, and it puts it in at many different orientations, okay? And some orientations will be stable and some won't be. If you put it on the corner, it's going to fall over. When it falls over, it might rock a little bit and then settle into a stable pose. And so we, we, uh, we take the, the previously unseen object that we've just scanned, we put it in, we drop it at many different orientations, we ask, where does it settle? And then after it, it settles in a stable pose, then we take a humanoid figure and we drop that on the chair or the object that we think is a chair. And then we ask, can we find a stable sitting orientation of this humanoid figure? And if we can, then we simultaneously have that this object is a chair and we know how to sit on that chair or how to seat a humanoid on that chair, okay? So, uh, so here is showing some of the stable poses of two kinds of chairs. Actually, one was a simulated chair and one was the real chair scanned and put into the simulation uh, with some smoothing. And then, uh, and then after we assess, yes, uh, uh, you know, th these are uh, orientations that are, are stable. We, we put it into a uh, uh, simulator. This is using Pi Bullet, but maybe some of the NVIDIA you know, uh, uh, environment might be, uh, you know, better for us. And then we do this sort of uh, can it sit on the object test, okay? And so for the case where the chair is upright, actually we find that it's usable, okay? Whereas if it's not upright, it's not usable. So we find the, uh, the orientation where it can be used and we assess that it is a chair. Okay, so then the next thing was, how do we use that information for the robot to take action in the real world? And so this is a post on the archive now, it's in review, uh, and that's put the bear on the chair. And so uh, this is, uh, this is a, a work again with uh, Hong Tao and my student Meng Shen and uh, postdoc Sipu. So the, uh, the Franca there was doing the 3D scan of the chair we put the chair into the simulation environment, find out that this is the best way to seat a humanoid figure. And then uh, now this chair happens to not be uh, reachable by the now, okay? So this is, the robot asks the human, please rotate the chair so I can reach the chair. Uh, and so then there's a combination of motion plan going on here. There's an articulated model of the robot and of the, of the human that would sit in the chair. Uh, and, uh, and so then it does some planning. How would the robot seat a humanoid or human in the chair? And we're not doing humans, but we have a proxy, a teddy bear is a proxy for a human. And then the robot is helping the, the teddy bear sit in the chair. So that's put the bear in the chair. Yes? You said you're finding the best way to put a humanoid in the chair. The animations look like you were dropping humanoids out of the sky. Those seem Different. Are you optimizing your your? Um, yeah. So what we're doing is we're, we're we're dropping the humanoid relative to the chair at many different orientations, and asking uh, where do we get the greatest success of stability of sitting and of retaining the sitting posture in the chair. So and we've done this for many many different chair models, uh, and, and many different chairs. You know many different chair models. Uh, and then things also that don't necessarily look like chairs, but afford sitting. So, uh, and time after time after time, it's, uh, it's successful. 
uh, I'll show you one case uh, uh, that I'm particularly uh, happy with, which is, uh, we, you know, oh, not here yet, but uh, anyway, it goes on and on, and, and we have many, many successes in this. Uh, the, the one that I'm very happy with is that we constructed a makeshift chair, which doesn't really look like a chair, but it still uh, recognizes that for uh, the sitting uh, functionality. So, uh, okay, so we also did an experiment. Oh, here's the chair. Uh, it'll come back again. There was a chair made out of my books, so I was happy about that. We could, uh, it could recognize using that as a, uh, as a, as a chair. So, so here, this is what we call the naughty human uh, scenario, where the robot says, please turn it a certain way, and the human turns it the opposite way, and then the robot says, no, I can't reach, please turn it. So this is the one made out of my books, the, the makeshift chair. So um, anyway, so uh, yeah, time after time after time, we get uh, success with this method. Now, uh, the next thing uh, after that is what we call prepare the chair for the bear, and that is uh, where the chair is uh, initially not in a sitable configuration. And again, we do the scan in advance. The robot has not seen this chair before, uh, but the chair does have a universal uh, handle or grapple lug uh, attached to it, actually multiple of them together with barcodes so the robot can recognize how to manipulate the object even though it doesn't know a priori what the object is. So it had scanned the bottom of it, now it turns it over, then it's gonna scan the top, and then, uh, and then it does the imagination of how to seat the humanoid figure on it, and then it reorients it so that the now can reach, and then what was shown in the previous slides then becomes uh, applicable. And this had to be in two steps for, for two reasons. First, to scan underneath, and secondly, because the range of the robot isn't sufficient to reorient it uh, for the uh, functional pose for the now to reach. Yeah, so then it's we're just doing like before. Well, anyway, you got the idea. So, um, so, so that's that. Um, and then the next aspect of this is, what, you know, can I pour into it? So this was a, I think it was IROS paper just not too long ago. So this was a, uh, a finalist for the HRI uh, uh, section. Uh, can I pour into it? So this is imagination of open containability. So that would include cups and boxes and pots, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, the idea is, uh, so let, I'll show you the sort of the punchline first and then how we get to it. So uh, over, oops, over here, these are, uh, let me go back. Uh, okay, so um, these objects are previously unseen by the robot. It goes through, it scans them, and then it determines are these open containers, and if, it's, if it says yes they are, then it figures out how to pour into them without any training, no prior data. That's why we call it imagination, okay? So, uh, so how does it do that? Well, there's previous work on filling containers. Uh, much of it has to do with uh, learning-based approaches, uh, but that's not what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing is this imagination idea, again, physics-based simulation, and we're limiting this study here to open containers, so not you know, a coffee cup with a top on it or, you know, you know some kind of thing with a, a hinge or anything. It's just an open container. So we're assessing, is it an open container or not? And so we need a definition, and basically an open container is something that you can pour into and have, uh, have the material that you poured retained inside. So again, the robot encounters a previously unseen object. It wants to ask, can I pour into this, okay? Because if I can, and if the material is retained, it's an open container. So how do you simulate that, and what are the steps? Well, again, we go through, we do a scan. We're doing a scan with a depth camera, but you could imagine doing something more sophisticated involving 
regular cameras and depth and you know, reconstructing more finely. But for our purposes, this was fine. So we do a reconstruction. Uh, then we take that reconstruction, put it into the simulation environment, and we drop a sheet of beads. And then we see, does some fraction of that sheet of beads get retained in the object? And if so, then it's an open container. And then the next thing is, uh, assessing it's an open container is one thing, but then having the plan for doing the pouring is another. But we actually get that from sheet of beads also because we get a, a sweet spot, uh, the center of mass of the footprint of all of the beads that go in get, informs us about where we would want to pour from. So then, uh, so here's, a, uh, a simula here's a, an actual experiment sped up by a factor of eight. So this robot looks at this coconut-looking thing, half coconut-looking thing, and asks, is it a, a container? Does it afford uh, containability? And uh, so it takes the uh, scan. Then we take uh, the result and put it into the stimulation. We drop the sheet of beads, and we say, uh, will it retain these? And you know, if we roll it a little bit, rotate a little bit, will the beads be retained? And so then we get the answer yes in this case. And then uh, we get from that uh, the number of, you know, sort of what fraction of the beads fall in and what is the footprint. Uh, and then we can start doing experiments or additional simulations about, okay, if I start pouring around the center of mass for, at different orientations, uh, what is my success rate of getting beads in versus having beads fall out. Uh, and so then that's all imagined prior to physical action. Uh, and then we, uh, then we do the real thing. Okay, the robot then goes, the cup here where it's, which has M&Ms in it is known, okay, in advance. But the half coconut thing was not known in advance. And, but by doing the physics-based simulation, we're informed about how to take the action in the real world. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that, and, and we have very high success rates with this. We tested this on many, many objects, which are both containers and not containers, uh, and then we compared to uh, the so-called affordance net, and we did quite well. Well, both did quite well when you're dealing with objects that are you know, in the training set. Uh, well, we don't have any training, though, but we still do well, okay? And then, uh, then we went beyond uh, the training set, and uh, we did other uh, objects. Actually, let me, so here's various objects here that you might not think of. Well, certainly a book is not a container because if you rotate it a little bit, the beads will fall off. But a candlestick, is that a container? Well, the robot says yes, because you can pour into the little moat at the bottom. Um, so, uh, so we did many experiments with many different objects, and we retain a very high uh, success rate of getting all the beads in uh, the various objects that are classified as container. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so here's just some simulations in showing in parallel, or not simulations, but experiments showing in parallel uh, the success of this approach for various objects that it characterizes as open containers. Uh, and uh, you can see, time after time, we get uh, successful results. Here's, a, here's one example where we didn't get it, where the neck of this bottle was too narrow that we couldn't get the beads in, OK? Um, so that's why it's 98% instead of 100%. Um, and so uh, you know, we're looking to uh, extend this work in the future. Uh, the nice thing about it is it's completely explainable. Okay, we know when it works, why it works, when it doesn't work, why it doesn't work, what it's doing, right? Because we program it to do it that way. And it's versatile up to, uh, you know, how many items you have in your, your dictionary. Uh, so actually, for the next five years, we're working on building this spirit dictionary with, you know, 25 or more uh, common household items. Uh, and so we want to merge that with natural language processing and, uh, and speech so that actually the definitions can be updated. You know, so if, if the robot bring, you know, grandma asks for a cup of tea and the robot brings a pot of tea instead, 
you know, because they're both open containers, maybe the definition wasn't fine enough, and then it could be updated by natural language uh, and speech. So, uh, and we want to work in uh, cluttered environments. You know, if there's occlusions, you have multiple objects on top of each other, the robot might have to, you know, push away some and get to the ones underneath uh, and, uh, and things of that sort. So, um, yeah, so the, the, all of our code, you know, is on a various GitHub links. And, uh, and I'll just summarize by saying, you know, at NUX Mechanical Engineering, we're hiring. I'm a robotics person. I want to see more robotics, learning, vision, people. We have all of those things in our department. Uh, and uh, I reviewed some uh, old topics as well as this topic, which is new for me, this object affordances and the spirit dictionary. And then the various, uh, you know, every, all of my papers with st my students now either have question marks or exclamation points in their titles, uh, as, as I showed in, in the talk today. And there's others as well, like, can I lift it? Or, uh, you know, things like that. So with that, uh, I'll be happy to take any, any questions. Thanks for the great talk. Um, so what if you couldn't use the gravity trick anymore in a sense that uh, the initial distribution you had to sample in order to query for affordances was super narrow? Like uh, you had to uh, hang a cup on a mug on a rack, but like you can't really drop it on anymore. You have to get the right angle and um, it has to go in like the um, yep. first thing. Yeah. So, well, in simulation, it doesn't matter if you drop it a lot as long as you get the right one eventually, right? So, but, but maybe your question is, uh, would the simulation find it, right? Is that, that would be in line with your question? I mean, like... With the, with the reasonable number of samples, I would say. Uh, yeah, with yeah. The, right. So, uh, yeah. Well, maybe the top rung it would find, but maybe like a lower rung it wouldn't find. But uh, so, um, yeah, I guess you could say and a, one affordance of a mug is that it can be placed on a rack like that. Right. So, uh, um, yeah, that's a good question. So if you want to go for the, but that, that gets to be very, very narrow of a definition. Like if you say a mug is something that you can hang on the third rung down on a rack, right? So, uh, but yeah, I'd have to think about that. Certainly we could get the first rung and maybe we could do some kind of, you know, extrapolation from that for, for lower rungs, I suppose. I see what you're saying. The mug is not supposed to be defined that way in the first place. Well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you're trying to use it in a certain way. Uh, but after you've identified something as a mug, if you want to, say, do the motion planning to place the mug on the third rack, that would be easier than trying to define the mug by something you can hang on the third rung of a rack. Thank you. I mean, I guess to follow up on that, so uh, what about like, I guess a classical affordance is opening a door. The, the, yep. the door handle allows me to open the door, right? Yep. At some point, maybe you have to do some planning in your definition of, uh, you know, like somehow the, it's not just dropping things from the sky, right? But is that the, do you believe that the affordances we need to make the spirit dictionary are all attainable by relatively simple simulation or planning? Or do you think at some point there are a, there's some things in the dictionary that really require solving seriously non-trivial just to evaluate them as an affordance? Right. So I, I don't want to give the impression that things falling from the sky is how, you know, imagination is defined. So it just happens to be that for these two initial examples, we could do it that way. But yes, the integration of planning uh, with the, the, the imagination is, is part of it. I would, I would see stochastic modeling, I mean, that's part of where I'm coming from, as a tool where you have some kind of baseline performance, but then you have some variation around it, and you test an ensemble of trajectories, and it's sort of a hit or miss kind of thing. Um, but also, again, this is all sort of in a purist view that we're only doing imagination. But in the practical setting, 
we'll probably end up linking up with deep learning results anyway. There's no reason to shut off ImageNet or AffordanceNet or you know, the various uh, pre-trained networks that are out there. And, uh, uh, you know, and it is possible, I forgot who mentioned this to me, uh, but uh, you know, the idea, can you take one of those pre-trained nets and then you do the imagination and then you add the result into the net so that you encapsulate that information in it and then use it from there afterwards. So as I say, I'm not a purist. This is just to add a new tool to the robotics community thinking. And uh, we're doing it this way only at the beginning because we're introducing the tool. But in the long run, you know, we can, I can imagine a seamless integration with other tools. So uh, how did you define the uh, property, physical property of the chair? So if the chair is made of uh, paper, then mm -hmm. the successful rate in, in the simulation will also be bad, right? Yes. So even, so if, if uh, in reality such a case happens, if the chair is indeed made of paper, then how your system recovers from a failure case? Right, so, uh, <laughs> so I would hope in grandma's apartment that there are not paper chairs that are there to trick her and the robot into injury. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that's a hypothetical case that could happen. The way I, uh, the way I view it is uh, if the robot ha can demonstrate uh, functionality to the level of like a four-year-old child, right, that that would be a great thing. Like, and the, 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 the teacup versus the pot idea you know, if a child brought a pot, we would think, oh, that, you know, good, great success. And so obviously the robot has nowhere near the intelligence of a, of a human child. Um, th these sort of uh, edge cases, you know, you could handle, I suppose, by uh, in, when we go to do the action, like reorienting the chair, you know, you can do some manipulation to test the properties. Uh, but your question is uh, equally applicable to any vision-based approach, right? Without testing manipulation, uh, without testing the, the you know, load capacity of the, the thing before seating a person on it, for example, uh, that would be true for any, any sort of method, I would think. It, will it be very expensive to simulate uh, with all the different um, properties? Can well, no, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to simulate all different properties. I would say, you know, you go and you do the scan, you take the scan, you put it in the simulation, you assess, you know, it has this, I believe it has this afford, I imagine it has this affordance. Then when you go to do the real thing, you're, you know, in imagination, it's not always right. There are mirages and hallucinations and things, right? So, uh, so then you have to go and maybe test more rigorously as a, as a step, when, you're involved, when humans are involved, you know, like if the robot really is helping grandma sit on something, then there should be a further safeguard to test the, the load uh, carrying capability. Thank you. Any more questions? So maybe to follow up, so like in the two examples that you showed, right? So there was a specific design choice of using a humanoid that is being dropped or dropping a lot of particles. And that choice seems to be very specific to the task that is being done. Mm -hmm. So to build a spirit dictionary and to extend it further, do you think this need to automate that choice? Or do you think for every new affordance we add, the process of a human defining how the simulation should work will scale up? Right, yeah, so that's a, a limitation of this method is that it's not an automated imagination generation process. It's really the human expert imparting prior knowledge. So in a sense, this is kind of like an expert system, but I don't like to use that word since it's not very popular these days. Um, so, uh, but in any case, uh, as a practical engineering matter, we probably have the human user or the human programmer uh, well, and crowdsource the definitions, you know, so that we have some sense of, you know, this is really how a chair should be defined. This is really how a cup should be defined. 
even if those definitions can be adapted later by the user. The idea is that can we have something with at least some reasonable functionality when the robot is delivered and you open the box and it's there, it can do something even in a novel environment. Um, but uh, one could imagine the definitions adapting you know, by some process, either by communication with the human user so that over time the dictionary morphs into something that's tailored to the particular human right, through, through conversation. Um, or uh, new definitions added in that way also. Um, but I'm not, we're not there yet. Thank you. You have a question, John? Hi, thanks very much. Um, I wonder if there's a way to sort of connect the first and the second parts of your talk in terms of, you know, we're fans of your work on the um, de dealing carefully with manifolds and robotics and understanding spaces. and. Um, as a kind of slam person, to me, uh, to me, um, you know, they say to a person with a hammer, everything's a nail. Mm -hmm. And a question I ask about the second part is: Are you using uh, motion capture systems or overhead cameras or anything to de to detect the poses of entities in the world? And um, how do you suppose the um, the manipulator was a mobile on a mobile base, for example, and you had to add uncertainty uh, potentially represented on on you know sort of manifolds and and all that goes with that, how does that map into the spirit kind of formulas? And so, so how do you, how, how does un, how does uncertainty about poses and measurements, possibly non-Gaussian, messy, hard to represent, map into the uh, uh, imagination? Okay, thank you. No, those are excellent questions. And uh, by the way, I have a copy of a book for you too, if, if you're interested. It. So Chad, Chad stole my copy. Okay. So, well, you uh, can have one. Yeah. Russ can have one. Uh, I brought two. Uh, so, um, and uh, so, uh, okay. So, so there, let me try to unwrap because there's several things in, in, in your question. Uh, so, first of all, we don't use overhead cameras. We only have a, a, a 3D camera mounted to the the robot that's doing the scanning currently, but that doesn't mean that's the only way. The more cameras, the better, and the more different kinds of cameras, the better. And then if you want to have a spectral grasping sensor to, to you know, feel the material properties, and you want to nudge things around and get a sense of their inertial properties, all of that could be integrated. But as this is, and, and this, is a, this is a project that just now has started funded, being funded. This is all the precursor work. <laughs> so just, just to let you know, so we're, we're at the beginning of a five-year project. Um, so, uh, so, so all of these nuances, you know, how do we incorporate uh, uncertainty or uh, distributions of, of, uh, of you know, here the, it's deterministic simulations, but you can add noise to things and so that the results you get are more robust. And then, yes, of course, I would like to integrate the previous modeling work with this. Uh, in fact, we, you know, even integrating our previous planning work, deterministic planning work with this has already been a, a big job. Um, but uh, it, we'd certainly want to, uh, to do that integration. And it may even be too big of a job just for us to do it. So happy to collaborate with others who'd, who'd like to you know, work on this. I'm not sure if I answered all the aspects of your question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> any any more questions? So also, Greg, like, could you also speculate in one of your initial slides? You talk about clutter environments. Mm -hmm. How you were thinking of dealing with that? Yeah, so, uh, well, it comes back to that picture of the monkey that I showed in Singapore. So, uh, you know, we go on these nature walks and I watch the monkeys and they come down and they go to the, where the trash is and they, they have not been taught, but they know how to peel open uh, Coca-Cola cans and lick out the remaining sweet stuff, right? So uh, I would like to have the robots to be able to, for, you first do a scan, you get, a, you know, you get this heap of stuff, right? You know, a messy apartment, you have clothing and whatever else. And then uh, it gets an initial picture and then it goes and it taps on things and then things separate out. And then uh, as they separate out, it can grab and 
uh, and then assess each one, right? So, uh, so the way I would handle clutter is to, to sort of as the baseline, first do one scan, then approach it, and then uh, you tap on things and see how they react. So I think of that as how a monkey would like interact with an unknown object. Um, and that's, yeah, that's how I would approach the problem. Time for maybe one more question, if anyone has. No? So, okay. well, thanks a lot, Greg, for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Let's